What's going on, people? Welcome back to another episode of the FF Ballbusters podcast. My name is Will. Joining me is my co-host, Eric. And today we're talking rookie running back rankings. Now that things have sort of slowed down a little bit, we've gotten past the combine and we're gearing up for the draft. But before we get into that, Eric, you got anything for the people? Yeah, man, just huge shout out to our audience. Thank you, as always, for the support that we continually get. Uh, but we want to keep that momentum going. So if you guys continue to enjoy the content, please let us know by leaving a like on the video and also hitting that subscribe button for us. That helps us out more than you know. And also hit that notification bell if you want to stay in the know for all of our latest releases. And last thing, be part of the conversation. Join us in the comments down below. Hit us up. Let us know what you think of our running back rankings, who you would have higher, lower, any of that good stuff. Uh, we'd be more than happy to talk to you about it. But with that, I'm ready to get into it. Absolutely. So like I said, we're getting into the 2024 running back class for these rookies and just talking about where they land for us now. So to give them some context, Eric, what do you feel about how this class has sort of shifted since, you know, the combine stuff like that has happened? Yeah, so it's been a while since we've done these rankings it was about two months ago like you mentioned prior to the combine prior to any any of the athletic testing um i think some of the biggest risers and fallers strictly based off of combine numbers uh guys like bucky irving and audric estime uh both had rough combines slow 40s didn't seem to be uh that agile in the agility testing either that definitely brought their stock down after being fairly high in both of our lists uh two months ago um, I think Marshawn Lloyd has shot up quite a bit. His side speeds, size speed score has been uh, fantastic. Um, his open field kind of shiftiness, elusiveness was on display uh, at the Senior Bowl and also at the Combine. Um, I think Jalen Wright uh, probably jumped up at least a little bit in the public eye. Uh, there's definitely a discussion that we're probably going to have later on in the video about how we feel about him uh, and whether that's deserved or not. Um, but I think he's gone up a little bit. And then there's some some guys that were definitely off the radar, like people weren't talking about at all, that shot onto the scene. One that I know you have on your list, Isaac Garendo out of Louisville, mm -hmm. um, crushed the combine. So he's he's been exciting to see. And a guy that I have, uh, Tyrone Tracy out of Purdue, definitely put himself on the map. Absolutely. A lot of these guys, and there's some been, been some names that were just completely kind of dropped out of rankings as well. Like uh, Will Shipley is somebody we had pretty high on the list, or at least I had pretty high on the list early on in the process, and he's since kind of disappeared off of that. Um, but like you said, it's just, in terms of clarity, I guess we're getting a little bit more, but there is still no real standout guy to this class. There have been guys who have been yeah. good, but nobody who's been really excellent, I guess. So... I guess I want to start this off with Trey Benson. We can talk about him a little bit because I know we talked about Jonathan Brooks before and how he was at the top of our list. And since then, things have possibly changed for you. We've kind of been going back and forth with Trey Benson and Jonathan Brooks. How do we feel in that conversation now? I'm. It's definitely gotten closer. Trey Benson is another guy that killed the combine. Um, he's another size speed score guy that's going to be fantastic i think is going to be coveted by a lot of nfl teams mm -hmm. um and jonathan brooks hasn't had the opportunity to show off the athleticism that he does have due to the acl injury he hasn't been fully recovered yet um and so i do think that 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 conversation has gotten a lot closer for me i still do have jonathan brooks at the top of my list um i just believe that he's a much more complete runner mm -hmm. um he's a lot he's a lot smoother i think he's got much better vision trey benson is more explosive. He's a lot faster. Um, I think traits wise and athletic wise, I think he does have Jonathan Brooks beat, but from a vision and just like running between the tackles standpoint, he's still got a long way to go. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. I think Jonathan Brooks is still at the top of my list as well. Um, but Trey Benson is a guy who we felt like he was also pretty well rounded in terms of just everything that he can do, like you said, but we didn't expect him to run a four, three, nine either. So <laughs> very true. Yeah, that's one of those things It kind of popped up, moved things around, shook it up a little bit. This is us kind of saying we're standing true on Jonathan Brooks and his value and how we feel about him. But at the same time, keep an eye on the market value and how things move, because this may move into a situation where Jonathan Brooks doesn't get drafted as highly because of, say, you know, the knee situation he's got going on. So he may become more and more of a value as we get closer to drafts. No, I completely agree with that. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, do you have any worry at all? Because <clears throat> like we, at least for me, I have him ranked here strictly based on what I've seen on tape, mm -hmm. the production that he's put up at Texas. 
and because I'm not that worried about the injury, I'm still willing to have him here. Do you think there's any there should be any hesitation about uh, limitation to his rookie year based on recovery from the injury and whether that should affect where he's ranked? I think if he's back by the time they say, which is by training camp, I think he should be okay by the time playing comes around. But, you know, something we've yeah. also become very aware of as the years have gone along is these ACOs take a little bit longer than just a year that we've been told. But at the same time, I think that he will be ready. And depending on the situation, he may not be called upon to do a lot early on, which is what I'm kind of hoping for, to be honest. Yeah, no, that's fair. Um, so Jonathan Brooks, still steady Eddie at the top for us. Trey Benson creeping up uh, and in that top tier. I think he was already kind of in that top tier last time we did this, but he's probably mm-hmm. moved up a little bit further. One guy that I want to get your take on, because I know that I've changed a little bit on him, uh, Blake Corum, um, when we did this two months ago, he was in the public eye, at least among the top running backs in the class, maybe the top guy at the time. Um, and we didn't quite agree. Where have you gone from there? And what's some things that you think about Blake Corum now? So I checked my old list. I had him as my RB seven, two months ago, and he has since moved up to my RB four. Just because, like you said, you made some good points where I feel like wherever he does get drafted at, even though he is an older prospect, he is, I guess, league ready. He is ready to at least, you know, take on some of these workloads. Whether the injury from his uh, sophomore year that he got injured, correct? Or was it junior year? Uh, Sophomore. Sophomore year. When he's coming off of that, we were kind of, you know. I'm sorry. Uh, He's he's a fourth year player. So it would have. He played this past year after the injury. So junior year. That's right. So it's this year coming off the injury. And he performed yeah. well. He performed yeah. well. Uh, he's going to probably get better, uh, more healthy as you know, the NFL season approaches. So I'm a little bit higher on Blake Corum now. And also, which is all the Jim Harbaugh, you know, talk. If he ends up landing with the Chargers, obviously he's going to be a big guy over there. Yeah. But I feel like with any team that, you know, does end up taking the Blake Corum, because he is going to come with at least a little bit of draft capital. He should get opportunity, and he should at least, you know, perform at the next level. Uh, How well, that's a whole different question, but I think in terms of value, he should be up here in, like, around the 5-6 range, or 4-5-6 range. It's a really interesting conversation. So, last time we did this, I think I had him at the back end of the top tier at 4. I've moved him up. I have him kind of as, like, a 2A, 2B with Trey Benson right now. Um, the thing that kind of did it for me is that he was clearly hampered by the knee injury, uh, this past year. He he was clearly not the same runner that he was in 2021 or 2022. Um, and also uh, this is just on me for not having done the appropriate research. Uh, it wasn't an ACL injury. It was a meniscus injury. Mm. Um, which, you know, either way, these guys at their age can recover from that, but that has an even better like return to play and return to form, Uh, timetable Um, so I'm not worried about what that means long term and I think based on the athletic testing that we saw from him at the combine especially in the agility drills we can see that he's already starting to return to what we saw from him prior to that knee injury Um, and so I really dove back into his 2022 tape and his 2022 numbers and he was much more impressive and much more explosive um, than he was in 2023 just visually to the eye Um, and also statistically you know, comparing him had he declared uh, when he could have, like comparing him to B. John Robinson and some of the top guys in that class, compared really favorable, favorably analytically as well. Um, he had a higher uh, PFF grade, rushing PFF grade than B. John Robinson did. Um, his ex- his explosive play numbers were in the same territory as well, which is not something that you really think of with Blake Corum, considering what he looked like in 2023. But I think he belongs in this conversation. Um, and, and the main thing for him is that he just almost never does anything wrong he hits the right hole when he's supposed to he gets you know he he plays within the confines of the play that was called and gets you the yards that you're supposed to get and gets you some extra occasionally as well uh whereas guys like trey benson marshawn lloyd bucky irving like they're athletic they can make big plays but you can't count on them consistently to hit you know the play as called Yeah, I remember it was a stat I saw. I forget exactly what it was, but it was just possible teams that Trey Benson could go to and just them, like, 
you know, not being good at blocking. And somebody retweeted it and was just like, yeah, it doesn't matter. He wouldn't hit the hole anyway. So (laughs) (laughs) it doesn't matter if people block well for him or not. But yeah, that's definitely, I can see that level of consistency coming from Blake Corm and like an NFL team really valuing a guy who goes out there and does his job. You know what I mean? Because it often is when players do a lot of extra stuff that, you know, bad things typically happen. But having a guy who is pretty, you know, consistent like that could make or break things too. Yeah. Um, So I think at this point we would have had our rankings up on the screen for a while so you guys have had a chance to look at them. But uh, we haven't personally talked about exactly where our rankings are at right now. Uh, So Jonathan Brooks Mm -hmm. is at the top of the list. Mm -hmm. Uh, Trey Benson is in that top tier. Who else is in like the top tier for you if you have it in tier breaks? So if it's those two up there, that's where the tier break kind of stops or the tier break happens for me. Uh, Because when it gets to that point, when we go down to the next tier, I would have Marshawn Lloyd and Blake Corum. So that's where the kind of tier breaks off for me because I got Marshawn Lloyd a little bit higher than Blake Corum. I just feel like he was somebody who did really impress at the Combine, kind of went out there and showed us, you know, everything that we thought about him, at least on paper, looks like it should be that way as well. You know what I mean? Uh, He's not like a guy like Bucky Irvin where it's kind of the opposite. Everything we saw on the field... It was what we wanted to see, but everything on paper didn't quite make sense. So it's tough to have Bucky Irvin. You know, he used to be my RB3 in this class. He's since moved back to five. So I've kind of switched things around to Benson, Brooks, uh, Lloyd, Corum, and Bucky Irving. Okay. In terms of my rankings there. But I feel like Marshawn Lloyd has really picked things up. The last time we did this list, he was my RB10. So he has definitely shot up quite a bit. I just didn't really know a whole lot about him. But ever since watching the tape, watching how good he is in the open field, how good he is at receiving, stuff like that, it just showed a lot of things that translate to success in fantasy football. So he's somebody I've definitely moved up my rankings quite a bit. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, He was my nine when we did it last, and he's my four now. Um, And I have uh, Brooks, Corum, Benson, and Lloyd all in that top tier together. Um, You know, I have them ranked, I think, other than Lloyd and and Corum being flip flopped, I think they're basically in the same uh, spots. I just have them all in that tier together. Um, but then you you brought up Bucky Irving, who has fallen down your rankings a little bit, and same for me. I think I had him at three last time we did this, and now I have him at six. Uh, let's talk about the the two combine mm-hmm. fallers, Estime and Irving. Yeah. Where do they land now? And what has kind of changed uh, with your view of them? So Irving went from my three to my five. And Estime went from my previous six to now nine. Okay. Uh, so in terms of just value, Bucky Irving, like I talked about, we've seen everything on the field. So I'm hoping what we've seen on tape is better. And what we've seen on tape is more indicative of how he's going to perform at the next level. Because if so, then maybe I moved him down a little bit too much. But... If that's not the case, and you know what we saw more of at the combine is more of what he's going to be an indicator of who he is as a player at the next level. It's uh, kind of middling. It's not. I'm not going to say he's going to be bad. I'm not going to say he's going to be mid. But at the same time, it's not as exciting as it was prior. Uh, we were shown a player who's supposed to be very athletic, very quick, and then at the combine, we didn't really see a whole lot of explosiveness out of him. So it's tough to yeah. really gauge him on that. And when it came to Estime. He is still a very well-rounded back, so I'm not going to say he's dead in the water, but he did run a 4.72. There's been a little bit of, uh, not scandal, but people, I guess, on Twitter doing their own timing of the 40 and saying, oh, no, he actually ran a 4.66. I trust the lasers on this one, so I'm going with the NFL official time. But even if he ran a 4.66, that's still not impressive to me. And you guys have seen, if you haven't, uh, my opinions on Alexander Madison and how he ran a four six seven. Uh, it's a little bit of that coming over here, but I do feel like Audrey Estime as a running back is still better than Alexander Madison in terms of just being able to get a lot of different things done out there on the field. So he slipped a little bit for me there, but at the same time, I feel like he kind of slipped for everyone, but I'm not as dramatic to say that this is going to drop him out of my top 10 entirely. It's just towards the back end, and he's got some room to move around, especially based on draft capital. Yeah. So both of these guys have been kind of on a roller coaster as of late, for me personally. Mm -hmm. Um, When we last did this, I had Estimate down at eight, and I now have him uh, up at five, which Mm. seems counterintuitive based on the combine performance. I also took that into account. He definitely ran slower than I expected. That matters to me. 
Um, but I also just hadn't, uh, the running back group in general, I had kind of neglected. I hadn't dove as deeply into the tape and into the film as I had with the wide receivers. That's kind of where I've been focusing since the combine has been finished. Um, but I dove into the numbers specifically. Analytically, Audric Estime is fantastic. He's like much, much, much better on paper than I expected him to look. Um, from a sheer volume perspective, from an efficiency perspective, from an explosive play rate, um, you know, he's not like a tackles force guy. He's, he's a big bowling ball type guy. He falls forward, but he's not going to shake a bunch of people. Um, but outside of that, he was amazing analytically. Um, and I think on tape, he was really good as well. So I'm, I'm comfortable having him where he is, and I think that we're going to get a nice discount on him if you're in the same kind of camp as me, mm -hmm. feeling as confident in him as I am um, based on those combine numbers. And then Bucky Irving, uh, I think, you know, we fall into a similar category here with where we have him ranked five and six. Um, that receiving upside is just too good to pass up on in a class like this. Uh, the, the rushing numbers, like the volume was there, not always the most efficient. Um, and obviously the size is a concern mm -hmm. and the, the lack of, uh, agility testing that we saw at the combine is a little bit concerning as well, which is why he's not in that top tier anymore, but the receiving profile is just incredible. Yeah, it's very true. He's going to be out there. Like you said, he does a lot of things that are going to transport, translate over well to success in fantasy football. I just hope that some of that quickness and burst is still there. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then moving to the next people we've got listed on here. So we've kind of talked about the back end a little bit. We talked about the front end. Who are some guys that you've got in the middle? I guess that's sort of six to eight range. Yeah, so uh, Jalen Wright is one that falls in here. Um, and we had a conversation kind of before we hopped on mm -hmm. about whether we consider him a riser or a faller. Technically, since we last did the ranks, he has risen up my board. Um, but I feel like as we got closer to the combine, there was a there was a big public change in opinion on him uh, to rise him way up the ranks. Uh, and I saw a couple different sites like Football Guys and some other ones have him as their RB1 in this class. Mm. Um, obviously, he had a great combine and he looks really efficient at Tennessee. Um, but what I was talking to you about is that Tennessee's offense is incredibly gimmicky. And even though he's in the SEC, it's good competition. He's not really facing boxes that he's going to see in the NFL. It was a lot of four and five man boxes that he was running against. So of course you're going to be efficient when there's nobody there to tackle you. I was about to say, if you're a good athlete and you're running against a four or five man box, you should be okay for the most part, but that's definitely not going to be the case at the next level. Uh, like you said, he has risen. I actually just realized he moved from nine to eight on mine. So like <laughs> he is a riser, but not by a lot. It's a lot of the same concerns we had before, um, just in terms of, and the fact that he came out to the combine and just did not run the fastest time out of the running backs. I was kind of really shocked by that because I thought that was going to yeah. be his thing. You know what I mean? It's still a good time. Yeah. But not what he, not what we thought he was going to live up to. Yeah. So I guess it's a, we tried our best to not be disappointed off of that. Cause like Eric said, it was still a good time. We still try to look at the player as a whole. But he just doesn't really do anything that really puts him very highly above any of these other guys that I've got ranked towards this top end. I've even still got Blake Cor not Blake Corm. Obviously, I've got Blake Corm ahead of him. I've still got Braylon Allen ahead of him by a little bit. I've got him at that sixth Same. spot. Um, and it's just, I know, guys, it's tough. It's tough because everyone, there's this whole debate on Braylon Allen where he didn't really do much towards the end, but he did a lot at the front end. His breakout age is 17. It's really, really hard to just give up on a guy like that. It really is. And I just feel like he's one of those guys that he's going to get to the NFL and he's going to perform really well at the next level. And everyone's going to be like, oh, man, I, I guess we were wrong about that. I guess we were a little bit too harsh in the process. And it's going to feel like a well duh moment. Or he's going to be terrible. And I don't really feel like there's too much of a middle ground between the two at this point. But what do you think about yeah. Braylon Allen? It, it's interesting. Um, I, I'm looking at his analytics right now. I, I kind of compiled all of the most important stats for running backs and put them all together. And he's sitting here right in the middle of the list. He's not that disappointing. He's mm -hmm. not that impressive. Obviously, the breakout age is what everybody's going to point to, and that matters. Um, 
and his volume stats obviously were great. He can clearly handle a big workload, but he wasn't particularly efficient. Um, he didn't force a lot of missed tackles. He wasn't that explosive. Uh, his first down rate is a little bit concerning, like compared to guys like Corum and Brooks and stuff like that who pick up first downs on a regular basis. It seemed like Braylon Allen wasn't able to do that. Not elusive. PFF run grade wasn't very impressive. Um, and especially in the receiving game, obviously that's there's there's very little to be worked with there. And then something I was even surprised by that some people might not be talking about is his PFF pass blocking grade was one of the worst in the class. Mm. Um, so he was already a question mark in the receiving game, but now if he can't block, I just can't imagine that he's going to be used that much on third down. So he's going to be limited to that first and second down role, which at his body type, he could make things happen with, but I just don't see a lot of upside. Yeah, it's tough. It's really tough. And we've seen guys even get to the league and sort of develop more of a pass catching role in offenses not like great ones but we've seen like even guys like Derrick Henry who end up going out there and getting some targets and actually you know performing well with them so maybe that's something that'll develop along the line but I think like yeah. you said like right now his ceiling is sort of the middle of the pack of this group and I don't like you said it's not super high for him anymore like it used to be yeah and that's exactly where we have him you said six yeah. I, I, I have him at seven yeah so, so. he's right there yeah uh, I also have your boy Ray Davis, who's gone up quite a bit for me as well, too, from not being on my list to definitely being on the radar now. I've got him at the seven spot, right in between Braylon Allen and Jalen Wright. And, okay. and just in terms of what I've seen, like you said, he is a pretty impressive player to watch. He's on the older side, but it doesn't really matter as much, especially for running backs, I feel like. Um, but I was impressed with this combine as well. Uh, you know, he kind of yeah. came out there and really put things together, showed that he isn't just, you know, a big bruising back. He does have some agility and quickness to him as well. Um, but he has just sort of really risen up my boards. But how do you feel about this spot? Who do you have as your, you know, sort of six to eight? Um, so I'll, I'll read it through. I got uh, Braylon Allen at seven, Jalen Wright at eight. Uh, I'm flip-flopping between Shipley and Ray Davis at nine and ten. I, I've, I've fallen on him a little bit, and, mm -hmm. and maybe I'm wrong to do so. Uh, and then I have Isaiah Davis at 11. Yeah. Um, with Ray Davis, still love the tape. I think his tape was one of the most exciting watches of any of the guys in this group. Um, and I think he did a great job at the Senior Bowl, really boosted his stock there, and like you mentioned, at the Combine as well. Um, so it is weird to me that I had a guy that I really liked that wasn't on people's radars. I had him listed at 5, ranked at 5 two months ago, and now I've fallen on him after good performances. Um, the thing was, I hadn't I hadn't gotten too far into his analytical profile. It's just not that impressive. Um, it, it's not terrible. He's kind of right in that Braylon Allen range where he's right in the middle of the pack, um, but he's just doing everything at a much older age. So that age-adjusted production doesn't look as good. Mm -hmm. um, he was also really inefficient in terms of uh, his yards per carry, which I know isn't always the most indicative of success but uh his yards per carry for his career was at a 4.9 the lowest of uh any of like the main running backs that we're going to be talking about today uh his best year was a 5.7 also among the lowest in the class um again film wise visually loved what i saw from him but i got a little sketched out when i saw his numbers that's fair that's absolutely fair I just feel like at the Combine, he showed at least a little bit more of who he is athletically, and I hope that that can translate pretty well over to the next level, because if so, at that size that he is, and being as quick and as fast as he is as well, could be a pretty dangerous combination at the next level. So hopefully they're able to put that together a little bit better. Absolutely. Um, and, and the guy that you put me on to, Isaiah Davis, is right after him for me. Mm -hmm. Where do you have him in your ranks? So he's right there at like an honorable mention for me. It was I was going okay. back and forth between him and Garendo at the 10 spot. But like yeah. I said, Isaiah Davis is someone who has really impressed me, and he hasn't really fallen too much in terms of value for me. I think he's going to be one of those sneaky sort of value guys towards the end of the drafts for sure. Yeah, I like that as well. He, he looks really good analytically. Um, it, it's also tough to find all of the stats that I'm looking for, considering uh, he was a South Dakota guy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so finding available stats isn't always the easiest with some of the smaller school guys. Uh, but from what I was able to find, he looked really efficient and really explosive. Um, 
and and clearly carried a workhorse role there. So that was good to see. Um, so you went to ten in your rankings. Yeah, I ended up going to ten with an honorable okay, mention. So I, yeah, I went to fifteen. Um, not that we have to talk about all of these guys, but Isaac Garendo is somebody that you mentioned that I want to talk about, and also Tyrone Tracy out of Purdue. Um, but why don't you start with Garendo? What did what did you see from him that's warranted him being on the map now? So Isaac Garendo really popped up on of our on our radars just because of the fact he did run the fastest forty time out of all of the running backs of the combine. So it was kind of just yeah. one of those. Well, who is this guy? You check and see he's a guy out of Louisville, and then I went to go check the stats. And that was when I realized, oh, he's been at Wisconsin and he was behind, you know, I guess Braylon Allen for a good period of time. So going to Louisville was like his first real time, really, I guess, handling the workload of being one of the main guys in the rotation. And he did really well with it. 810 yards, 11 touchdowns off 132 carries and still 22 receptions. Turned that into almost 250 yards. It just showed a good amount of production to go along with him. And he's a guy who, like I said, some people bring in this whole sort of mileage argument into I guess running backs and I guess usage in college if you're one of those people who's sort of a mileless purist who thinks they want a guy who hasn't done a ton who's still got a lot left in the tank Isaac Garendo is sort of the definition of that guy I feel <laughs> yeah. like um yeah. it's not something I really value too much because a the guy they said coming into the NFL too much Jonathan Taylor had too much tread on his tires okay he's mm -hmm. still rolling so it doesn't really matter but at the same time, if that's something you're looking into and a guy who could potentially make something happen at the next level with just his you know, athletic traits, uh, Isaac Garendo is a guy who really could put it all together. Yeah, I, I think I agree with everything you said. Obviously really athletic and doing so at 221 pounds. Yeah. Great size, speed combo. Really, really impressive. Um, and you made a good point. He, he was behind uh, a much higher prospect than Braylon Allen. Um, and then when he finally got the chance to shine, he took that opportunity and ran with it. Um, but he's six years out of high school. Like, that's a long time. Um, and I know you made a good point about the fact that he was behind uh, Braylon Allen for a lot of those years, and that makes sense. But, you know, Braylon Allen's only been out of high school three years. So there isn't all overlap there. Yeah. There was some time there where he had the opportunity to earn the starting role and didn't. So there's obviously those question marks about why didn't he get that opportunity? Why didn't he produce earlier? Um, he obviously took the opportunity when he got to Louisville and ran with it, and you love to see that. Um, but yeah, th it, this is all kind of culminating into why he wasn't on the map to begin with um, and why it, he's at least worth revisiting after this great combine performance um, and having this type of athletic testing at 211 pounds. like it's hard to beat that. Um, so it makes sense that we're talking about him, but he's still down here just outside the top 10. Um, and then the other guy that I wanted to mention quickly is Tyrone Tracy out of Purdue. Another guy, similar situation where he's also, I believe, yeah, six years out of high school. So definitely an older prospect. Fantastic production from a receiving standpoint. Um, He's, he's been really under the radar, uh, and it makes sense, again, because of his age. Um, but his projected draft capital actually isn't that bad. He's currently listed as, uh, or projected by NFL Mock Draft Database as the 106th pick, um, which is like right behind Bucky Irving, right in front of Audric Estime. So I think the NFL is valuing him more than maybe the fantasy community is right now. Mm -hmm. um, and if he can produce in that third down role, I think there's absolutely a chance that he could be fantasy relevant for us. Absolutely. And then even taking a look at the combine numbers, he performed pretty well. 4.48, 40, 40 inch vertical jump, uh, 1.5 in the 10 yard split. I think, you know, he shows a lot of traits of being able to at least be explosive at the next level and get some stuff done too. somebody like you said that hasn't really been on my radar too much. But since I seen the combine, and I saw his name pop up. I was like, oh, he's definitely somebody we should at least take a look into. So I like that pick a lot. How do you feel about Dylan Johnson before we get out of here? I don't even have him ranked. Yeah. Um, uh, watching him, like, I don't know. It seemed like he was always fighting through an injury, which is impressive. Um, and I think he performed well at Washington. Um, but I wasn't that impressed with the analytical profile. And I wasn't very impressed athletically with him uh, at the combine or anything like, anything like that. Yeah, I agree. I didn't. I don't think he really... I feel like that was his opportunity to really show us something, and he didn't. So... Yeah. yeah, I don't really have him too high up. I've just seen other people ranking him in like their top 
12s. I've seen 15s with Dylan Johnson. I think that's mainly off of name because I think there's still a lot of other guys out there who are probably going to perform a little yeah. bit better. But I, I agree. would agree. But that is going to round out our list right there for our you know running back prospects. Just our thoughts on them after we've gotten past the combine. Just to make sure that's clear for you guys. Uh, we're a month away now from the draft. I think as of yesterday, exactly a month, or as of the 25th, exactly a month. Um, so I'm really excited. Things are starting to ramp up a little bit. And we're going to actually get some landing spots for these guys and give you some real, real actionable information because drafts will be coming up soon as well. So just really good information here. So make sure you guys are hitting that subscribe button, hitting that notification bell. That way you know when we drop all of our latest videos. Hit that like button. It's absolutely free, and it's the best way to get our stuff out there into the YouTube algorithm. And drop down in the comments below what you feel about our rankings. If you've seen, you know, if you've seen them up on the screen this whole time, let us know what you think about them uh, as we've gone through. Anybody you agree with, disagree with, anything that you feel like we're not taking into context with some of these guys, let us know down in the comments below. But uh, Eric, you got anything else for the people before we get out of here? Yeah, man, if you guys could just check out some of the links that we have down in the description below. Uh, if you want to join our community in our Discord, we are growing just a great group of people over there that are talking every single day about Dynasty, about fantasy, about startups, uh, about trades, about regular life stuff. So if you're interested in joining a community like that, check our link down below. You can hit that and join up over there. And then also check the links to our sponsors and our partners as well, whether it be Do Numbers. I'm wearing one of their hoodies right now if you're interested in some cool uh, apparel, hats, t-shirts, hoodies, any sort of merch like that. And also, if you're looking for some cool, cool music, we have Choice Music Group linked down below as well. And as always, we end our videos with some of their music over there. So go check that out. That would be much appreciated. Uh, but I think that's all I got. So if you guys have stuck with us all the way until the end, as always, we love you. And we'll catch you in the next video. Peace. 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 Bitch, I'm